Okay, this lecture is going to be on systematics, which is the study of phylogenetic trees and cladistics. Okay, so all trees show evolutionary relationships among sets of species. So this is an evolutionary tree of all living things. We're going to be looking at cladograms, which are a specific type of phylogenetic tree. So in order to understand a tree, I want to start by showing you what a branch on a tree truly represents. So um, we're going to we're going to look at these species of uh, shepherd's purse. And so we're going to look at five individuals within the parent generation. And we're looking at these lines that represent cross pollination. So there's an exchange of pollen between this one and this one and this one and this one and so on. And then we get these offspring. So we can look at these guys and these lines just represent who's cross pollinating with whom. Okay, now if I open this up and expand it more, I can look at not just five individuals, but many more individuals within generation one. And not just generation one and two, but go on all the way to generation five. And so all the lines again represent cross-pollination between the different individuals of that generation. And so finally what I can do is take away the individual organisms, which are pretty hard to see on my slides anyways, and I'm left with just this braided effect of all of the cross-pollination among all the different organisms. And now if I apply this to what we're seeing on a tree, if we take this and we magnify this so that we're now seeing about 80 generations of about 250 individuals in each generation. And then you can continue to expand that where you're going hundreds of thousands of generations. You can see that you no longer see the individual lines. You just have this braided effect, which is be fuzzy. And so now I can apply that to my tree. And I'm just looking at this little branch in time here on this tree where, and let's see if my highlighter will help you out here. So just this period of time where there's gene flow, where there's organisms going back and forth, back and forth, cross-pollination, cross-pollination across many, many, many generations. And that's represented by this tree. Okay, now the trees also show branching. And the branching is where you have um, genetically isolated populations, where the populations can no longer, there's no gene flow. They're not cross-pollinating or interbreeding. And so here we have a species of um, of squirrel and over here another species of squirrel and now these have been separated over many 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 hundreds of thousands of years um, by this river cutting through the Grand Canyon and now they have speciated or if we brought them back together they would not be able to mate and produce viable offspring they do however have a common ancestor at some point in history and here's another example of speciation where we have this population of fish and if these, this group gets separated in, say, maybe a northern region, and these guys get separated in maybe, say, a southern region or something, and these guys are subjected to different selective pressures than these guys, and so now we have a speciation event where we end up with two different variations. And if these fish were to get back together, to get together with these guys, they would no longer be able to reproduce. So they're just adapting to different environments when they've been separated, and there's no gene flow between them for a long period of time. Okay, the other thing when we're looking at a tree is very often we put the um, ancestral species at the bottom. So it kind of does look like a tree rather than what I was showing you before. Um, and then we're going to take away all this fuzzy line here and just draw a straight line. So this is what we're going to be looking at for these trees. And so this is a point of divergence in evolution. And this is a period of gene flow across several hundreds of thousands of generations and so on. Okay. The other thing when we're looking at these trees is it doesn't matter the orientation. So all four of these trees show exactly the same thing. So they're all showing you the same evolutionary history. It doesn't matter whether they're placed so that the ancestral species is at the bottom or the ancestral species is at the top. Or instead of using these straight lines you know, on an angle like this, we go out and then up, showing the exact same evolutionary history. We can put it upside down, we can put it sideways, it doesn't make any difference. It's still showing the same evolutionary history. Okay, some of the terms that we'll be using, the tips of the tree, the tips of the branches, we will call them either the tips or the taxa. Taxa means names. Sometimes you'll see one where the name will be down a little bit further. It won't line up across the top. Generally, that indicates that that species has gone extinct. Okay, down at the bottom, we have the root of the tree, and that's going to represent our ancestral species. And then each of these branch points are called nodes. And as we move this direction, 
we're going more recent in time. As we go back in this direction, we're going back in evolutionary history. And they have on here internal and external branches. I don't think we need to worry about that. Okay. The other thing um, when you're looking at trees is to make sure that you're looking at the branching. When looking at these nodes, this is what's most important. Don't be distracted again by the shape or the, the orientation of the tree, as I showed you before, but also don't be distracted by the location of the organisms at the tips here. So to see if we understand that, I need to get rid of my pen, um, is A and B, or are A and B, are, here's B. Now is B more closely related to A or is B more closely related to E? Okay, hopefully you s looked at this diagram and you said, okay, where is the common ancestor between A and B? And I want to find the common ancestor between A and B. I have to go down the tree until the two of them converge right here. So this is what the point of divergence, and that is node one. So this is back pretty far in evolutionary time compared to the rest of my tree. Now I go to B and E. I follow B down, I follow E down, and they come together right here at node two. Node two is more recent in, ancestor, in the evolutionary history. Therefore, B and E are more closely related than A and B. So don't be confused by the fact that the tips are close together. Always go and look for that node. Where do they have last share a common ancestor? Okay, the other thing is that the tips, um, the order of the tips is not meaningful. Uh, I think of these as like a, um, what do you call it, a, a mobile. And so in a mobile, each of these little joints here would be able to rotate. And that does not change the evolutionary history. If I took D and E and I flipped them, they still would have a common ancestor at this node. That would not change their evolutionary history. I can take A and flip that one over and end up with a diagram that looks like this. And I'm not changing the evolutionary history. So don't be confused, again, by the order of the tips. Always look for those nodes and where, how far back in history are those nodes. Okay, so just to apply this to something that maybe makes a little more sense to you, but again, we're just talking about a couple of individuals and a couple of generations, not the magnitude of this evolutionary history that I'm talking about. Okay, so here's you on my evolutionary tree, on my uh, pedigree here, and here's your first cousin. So how many generations do you have to go back to find the ancestor of you and your first cousin? Okay, hopefully you said two, and if you said two, hopefully you were looking and saying, okay, here's one generation that we're in. We have to go back this generation to our parents, and aunts and uncle there, and then finally back to our grandparents, and you and your cousin share a set of grandparents, which means that you and your cousin have to go back two generations to find a common ancestor. Okay. How far back to find a common ancestor between your nephew, or what, how far back would your nephew have to go to find a common ancestor between him and your first cousin? All right, and hopefully you see that that's three. So we go back one, two, three. The same ancestor is the common ancestor between your nephew and your first cousin as you and your first cousin. That's how far you'd have to go back to find a common ancestor. Okay, so the tips of the trees also do not represent ancestors, and I think that makes more sense when we look at a pedigree. So you and your cousin share a common ancestor. So we can focus on your grandfather. So your grandfather is a common ancestor between you and your cousin. Your grandfather is not you and not your first cousin, and you're not a descendant of your first cousin. You are a descendant of your grandfather. Your first cousin is a descendant of your grandfather. You share a common ancestor. So we can't say that you um, are a descent. We descended from apes, right? Apes and humans share a common ancestor. We'd have to go way back in evolutionary time to find that common ancestor. But we would never say that you are a descendant of a living species today. Okay. 
um, some more vocabulary um, and concepts here. We use the term clades and in doing cladistics, and a clade represents a mono, mono phyletic group. By that, I mean a group of organisms that includes the common ancestor and all of the descendants of that common ancestor. So here we have a common ancestor and all the descendants of that common ancestor. And a way to kind of look at this that might help is we could take one cut of the scissors and remove a section, that's a clade. Now, these are like Russian nesting dolls in a sense. We have clades nestled within clades. So I can call the bird and the crocodile a clade, but I can expand this to include the lizard. If I cut this tree right here, I now have a clade that includes the lizard, the crocodile, and the bird. I can go even further and say this whole thing is a clade. I cannot, however, say that the crocodile and the lizard are in a clade and exclude the birds. Because in order to do so, I would have to cut the birds off here and cut the crocodile and the lizard off here. So two snips of the scissors, so that is not a monophyletic group. Um, okay, and then one rule that we use when we're trying to decide how to place these organisms onto a tree is we use this, um, a principle called parsimony, and it just means the simplest. So in this case, I have these three organisms that lack legs and these four organisms that have legs. So the most logical explanation would be that at some point in here, there was the evolution of legs. So the somewhere these organisms evolved legs. I would not place the evolution of legs in several places on my tree. It would be more, more, uh, more likely than not that it was one evolutionary event and that all of these organisms share a common ancestor that had legs and that these guys did not have that. They came before that evolutionary event. So this has led to some changes in how we group organisms. So in this one here, we have reptiles. And if you notice, the reptiles are here with the turtles and the crocodiles, and we are here and here, and the snakes and the lizards. Now, given our understanding of clades, can we call reptilia a clade? You learned in elementary school that there were fish and then in the vertebrates and the organisms that had backbones, there were fish and then there were amphibians and then reptiles and birds and mammals. We have now moved that around a little bit. So the birds are actually more closely related to a crocodile. They have a common ancestor here. Then the crocodile is to the lizard. I'd have to go all the way back to here to find a common ancestor between the crocodile and the lizard. And turtles, their common ancestors way back here to all of these other groups. Okay, another example is with the platyhelminthes. In your first year of biology, you were probably taught that they were pretty low on the evolutionary uh, tree, and that's actually incorrect. The platyhelminthes are actually higher up on the, um, the evolutionary tree. You may have learned the term acelomate, meaning that they lacked a coelom. It turns out that they're, um, they had a coelom and probably lost that coelom along the way. Um, and they're actually more closely related to the annelids than to than the annelids are to the nematodes. So these are the round worms and these are the the um, like a leech or an earthworm, the ones that have little rings, segmented worms. All right, just another example. Here we have all of the dinosaurs. So this is the the clade of dinosauria, and we have birds way up here at the top. So we now believe that the birds are the descendants of the dinosaurs. And that's the end. Um, this is a link to a, a website if you want some more practice with phylogeny and phylogenetic trees. And that's the end. I hope this helped you understand and I'll see you in class.